Professor Benton is a Professor of Vertebrate Paleontology in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Bristol. Uh, he's a world expert on um, vertebrate pale paleontology, uh, and he is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And this year, uh, I'd like to warmly congratulate, him, congratulate Professor Benton on becoming Fellow of the Royal Society in England. Professor Benton is uh, an expert on the extinction events, uh, Triassic reptiles, and um, as we are about to hear on determining the colour of dinosaurs. The, I think the thing which fascinated me most about you, Professor Benton, is that you've actually got a dinosaur named after you, the Bentonix, which uh, I think we can all be very envious of. Anyway, it is uh, a real pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the Society and for you to give us your talk. Thank, Thank you very much. I, I think I'm OK. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. Thank you all for coming. Um, tonight's talk is about what's on the screen, obviously. Um, but the purpose of that is to also use this as a way to try and show you some of the things that paleontologists, evolutionary biologists find important, um, the nature of evidence and how we deal with evidence and uh, inference when we're dealing with historical sciences. Um, and also, I hope, set this in a, in, in a context uh, of, that goes just beyond the, the, the clever trick of being able to tell the color of feathers of fossil organisms. So I'll try and roll together a few different aspects tonight, and I hope, I hope it, uh, it, it, it makes some sense. Now, paleontology is a, a relatively small discipline worldwide. I have no idea how many uh, professional paleontologists there are. Is, is probably, I suppose it is in, in the low thousands. So it's very rare, unlike in biomedical sciences, where this is commonplace, that we are all rushing for one conclusion, one big result. My son is a virologist, and I hear about this from him, of course. There are competing teams in different medical research facilities in different countries, and they're all sort of watching each other, and we've got to get there first. Nonetheless, oddly enough, in my field, uh, in, in nature and in science, two papers were published early in 2010. Um, one by essentially the Bristol team, this was us, in nature, and the other one by the Yale team in science. And they were both, both purporting to be the first paper to give objective evidence of the color of the feathers of dinosaurs. And of course, that would be something that every seven-year-old boy would be fascinated by. Whether anybody else cares, I'm not at all sure. <laughs> but let me tell you a little bit of the story, how that started, um, how we got involved, what happened in the end. So I can now say this, would, th this is one dinosaur which I'm going to talk about called Sinosauropteryx. This is one reconstruction. This is another reconstruction. I can say this is incorrect and this is correct. That's what it looked like. So that's quite a claim, and, and let's see whether you think that we've done it or not. So the story begins in China, in uh, Liaoning province, which is this one here. This is North Korea, South Korea. Beijing is here. Um, for those of you who know China, you will not be surprised to realize that it looks close, but it isn't. That's 500 kilometers. It's a full day's drive from Beijing to Liaoning province. And the rock formations that have created the uh, excitement for the last 20 years are parts of the Jehol group, which means in an older version of Chinese, apparently, hot river, Yehol, something, or Jehol, something like that. So just a couple of quick images of the fieldwork. The first time I went to China was in 2007. Uh, we had had some Chinese colleagues visiting us in Bristol, and we were invited to go there and do some field work. This is what some of the um, rocks look like from which the extraordinary fossils come that I will show you in a moment. Um, and so the farmers in this northeast part of China, which has quite a cold climate, and the soil is thin, um, so these rocks are very close to the surface. They plow them up. They find these pieces of shale. And almost every piece of rock that you see here would contain fossils. They're very uh, frequent. 
and, and very beautiful. But my other memories of China, of course, and, and for anybody who's been to China, especially in an official capacity, you'll, you're, it's, all, it's all about food. You, you spend all your time having banquets. Now, these Jehol rocks are uh, I I I I extremely extensive, uh, and, and they're extremely fossiliferous. So this is one locality, one quarry called Sihetun in Liaoning province. And m uh, 10 years ago, uh, Chinese colleagues conducted quite extensive excavations where they, they dug down and they just sort of peeled it off layer by layer, collecting the fossils <laughs> as they went. And from that one locality, they retrieved about 1,000 fossil bird specimens. So many of you will have been brought up, as I was, um, to know about Archaeopteryx and, and to be uh, aware of the fact it was supposed to be the world's most valuable fossil. There are only 10 or 11 specimens of Archaeopteryx altogether, and they're all supposed to be worth millions if, if you could sell them. And yet this one quarry produced 1,000 specimens of equal quality. Uh, and they built a museum on the site so that you can see the rock section here up the wall. And then these illuminated chambers on the floor uh, are, are showing fossils in situ. So on that one bed, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, half a dozen complete fossil birds just, just preserved there. So it's an extraordinary treasure trove of, of material. And the fossils look like this. There's a great list of different beasts. Uh, which include creatures that lived in the lakes. So we're looking at sediments that were preserved in ancient lakes uh, with, with lots of volcanic ash uh, uh, sort of helping to seal them in. But there's this great list of things which include lake living creatures and animals, dinosaurs and mammals and birds that either lived around the side of the lake or flew across the lake. And then all of these things are, are preserved in several hundred meters of, of sediment. This would be the kind of reconstruction of the scene that, that Chinese colleagues produce with, with the sort of, it's exaggerated, but the kind of diversity of creatures. And I should say this is dated to about 125 million years ago, so early Cretaceous. Now, this is, this is where we get down to business. So this dinosaur fossil here was the first that was um, published in the West. There had been... Um, so that geologists had been aware of these rocks for quite a long time. They were first named the Jehol group in the 1920s, um, and yet and, and the, the fossils had been found. But th these kinds of dinosaurs and birds had not been reported until 1996. So some of you who look at nature or science every week, you, you may vaguely remember 20 years ago, almost every week, nature had a, a front page picture of one of these fossils, and, and these were just appearing week after week, ever more amazing specimens coming out of China. So this particular beast, Sinosauropteryx, meaning something like Chinese reptile wing, um, this was the first to be named. And, and of course, what created um, the excitement was, here was a dinosaur that was similar to Compsognathus that had been found in the 1850s in Germany, but this was so exquisitely well preserved that there were internal organs, probably things like liver and guts, that the eye spot, the retina, is preserved, so the black melanin of the retina has somehow survived. But most importantly, there's a sort of, a sort of fuzz along the back of the head and the neck and the back uh, of, of small um, bristle-like structures, which are sort of dark colored the way they're preserved. And then in the tail, notice this sort of striping or tufty appearance. So the, the, the question was, what are these? And when, when, when you look at them more closely, so this is a close-up of part of the tail. You can see the vertebrae of the tail. And there are these whiskery structures along the side. And they have this very definite striping. So there was a sort of debate. And, and G and G, who published it, they, they were careful. They called them protofeathers because they, they're not branching like typical bird feathers today. They're just simple sort of whiskers or bristles. So what are they? Um, and, and so that went on, and, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. Ever more astonishing dinosaur specimens came to light. These belong to groups that were already known from other parts of the world. 
but the preservation in these Chinese, ancient Chinese lakes was so exquisite that you could see the, the feathers on each of them. So here's the head tipped back and legs and the arms. And close up, this one had more complex branching feathers. And most astonishing of all is Microraptor. It's still a dinosaur. And, and along the, the elongate arms um, are these, these flight-type feathers. So they had these veined feathers with, with a quill and with branching um, uh, 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 structures at the side, just like a modern flight feather. And primaries and secondaries and coverts, and not only on the forewing, but also on the hind limb. So bizarrely, this creature was, was a tetrapteryx. It was a four-winged flying creature. But calculations of the area of the wing and, and the putative body mass suggested that none of these dinosaurs could fly in a powered manner. They could glide, but they were not powering themselves and staying aloft all the time. But that's another story altogether. There are fossil birds there, of course. I mentioned Confucius Ornus already from Sihitun. Here, you know, if you've seen specimens of Archaeopteryx or photographs, there's nothing like this, nothing at all like this, where you have two specimens together. And this is a putative female and a putative male, and I think you can see why people said that. And so we'd love to get at these banner-like tail feathers to look at the colors that they may have had. Because one would predict, of course, they would surely be brightly colored. There would be some kind of display structure. Not only are there specimens of whole birds and whole dinosaurs, there are embryos within eggs. So this really is a genuine fossil. There it is blown up. It's probably, it would sit in the palm of your hand. Um, and there is the eggshell. You can see the, the tail, the coccyx, the tail here curled around. The head, the eye, it, the head is sort of pointing down. This may help to sort of understand what's there. It, it's just, it's all there. It, it's just astonishing what, what they were finding. Stomach contents, feathers, crests, all kinds of structures that tell you something about what they, they may have looked like. I won't go on too long about that. There are thousands and thousands of wonderful specimens. So let me just interject briefly. How do we use this kind of evidence? Because, of course, um, if, if you're trained to understand that science is an experimental or, or relies on experimental approaches, how can you do experiments on fossils? How can you test events that happened once a long time ago? Well, I would argue that we have at least three kinds of approaches, which I'll just touch on briefly. I've been showing you empirical evidence, specimens. You can see what they look like. You can look at them under the microscope. You can attempt to interpret the anatomy of these things. Obviously, you make comparisons with living organisms to do that. And there's a fair amount of confidence in, in what you're identifying. That's obviously the femur. That's obviously the ulna. These are clearly feathers. They look like feathers. They are feathers. Um, but in addition, we have footprints. That tells you something that happened on a day 150 million years ago. You can see impressions of the skin sometimes in the footprints. From their spacing and their size, you can work out the speed that the animal was moving. Uh, sometimes we get caught in the act kind of examples, like fish A, the big one, is eating fish B, the little one. So that tells you something about the food chain. Maybe it says that fish A shouldn't be eating fish B, but there we are, because it died as a result. And of course, there are fossil poops, and they tell you something about the diet as well. Here's another thing. How do we choose our modern analogs? If you're, if you're trying to understand something about the biology of a dinosaur or any other extinct creature, how do you choose what you compare it with? In some cases, it's kind of obvious in a way. If it's a fossil mammal, you compare it with living mammals. If it's a, a fossil hominid, Australopithecus, you compare it with modern humans and, and maybe modern apes, and you hope to get some insights. Well, the key here, a very simple observation, is the so-called extant phylogenetic bracket. Because, of course, it would be a mistake to interpret Australop Australopithecus only with reference to modern humans, wouldn't it? Because you can't assume that what we have, all fossil hominids would have had as well. They clearly didn't. But if you bracket it with, for example, modern humans and the gorilla or the chimpanzee, then you can maybe say something if there are shared characteristics. And in the larger scale, dinosaurs fit in here. They're sort of along the line to birds. And this example is to do with eggs. So 
We know that, that the, the modern bird's egg has certain characteristics. They are shared with the modern turtle egg, the shell, the extra embryonic membranes. They're the same. And therefore, you can assume that anything bracketed by birds and turtles will have had that same kind of egg. Even if you don't have a fossil egg, you don't need the fossil. Because the likelihood is, the probability that, that Occam's razor, the parsimonious view, would be that anything bracketed in here, so this includes all the fossil reptiles, and then actually primitive mammals, the, the, the echidna and the duck-billed platypus, as you know, they lay eggs with a calcareous shell and extra embryonic membranes. So this is telling us everything all the way back to the Carboniferous, maybe 300 million years ago. Everything that is not an amphibian, the things we would call reptiles, birds, and mammals, all share that egg. So even though you don't find it, you know pretty much the likelihood is everything in there, the hundreds and hundreds of fossil species, would have had that characteristic. And the third thing is that for, in some cases now using um, digital uh, imaging and material properties and engineering approaches, we can actually do experiments on fossil bones. So you don't have to have the bone as, 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 as a structure from a recently dead organism to do experiments on it, to work out breaking points and stresses and strains. You certainly, this is a, this is a skull of T. rex, so you, there's no point doing it with the fossil because the fossil has turned to rock, so obviously the physical properties are entirely inappropriate, and it would shatter and break up, and you wouldn't learn anything about the way T. rex operated. Likewise, it would be entirely pointless to work on a model. You know, if you made a model in plastic or metal, it would be pointless because the material properties are quite different. But of course, you can see where I'm heading. Once you have made a 3D scan or a model that you can take into a computer as a digital model, you can partition it into um, artificial segments or elements or partitions of some sort, as you wish to call them. And they can then be given the material properties applied to the model. And this is commonly used in, in designing uh, uh, replacement hip joints and so on, you know, in human medicine. But we apply it all equally to the fossils. So in this case, the T-Rex skull, the model of it in the computer, is given the material properties. I need to tell you that the bone, the fossil bone of T-Rex, when you section it and look at it in microscope section, you can see all the detail. The cancellous structures are there, the osteocyte lacunae are there. You can see it all. So bone is remarkably well preserved. And so we can ascribe material properties from modern organisms to T-Rex. You can vary them, vary them as intimately as you like. The teeth obviously have the properties of teeth. Uh, the elements of the skull have the properties of bone. And then you can do experiments. And then you can apply forces, and you can look at the stresses and strains, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another whole range of approaches that we can use also. So let's, let's go on to what we can never know. I've been teasing you. How do we know the color? Some of you may know the story. Some of you perhaps not. And of course, I would have said a few years ago, of course, we'll never know the color and we'll never know the sounds. We can learn about feeding in the way I've shown you. We can learn about locomotion using trackways and also using these kind of engineering approaches. Um, but colors and, and sounds, of course. So let's have a look at color. Um, and, and, and it's all to do with melanin and, and melanosomes. These, these are the key aspects. And so just a little, just to brush this up a little bit. We all know about melanin, of course, and, and we know about um, eumelanin and pheomelanin, the two forms of melanin, which are chemically different, A and B here. And that uh, eumelanin, the, the common kind that gives you freckles and dark hair and all the rest of it, is responsible for blacks and browns and grays. And the absence of melanin in hair, the absence of melanin in skin tends to give pale colors, of course. But pheomelanin gives ginger. And it's not only humans, but all mammals use just those two chemical forms, those two pigments. So the only colors in mammals, the only colors in mammals are those melanin colors. And so a person with ginger hair, a red squirrel, those colors are pheomelanin. And all the other colors come from eumelanin. And the, the intensity, whether it's black or gray or various shades of brown, as, as I'm sure you know, depends on the, the, the packing, the amount of melanin that's present. Now, of course, when melanin goes into a hair or a feather, 
it, it, the melanin is passed through from the, the tips of the, the projections of the melanocyte into the, 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 the root of the developing hair or feather in the follicle, and then it's encapsulated within the keratin of the hair or the feather in a melanosome. So it's, it's, it's only because of those melanosomes that the, this can become detectable in the fossils. Birds are different, or they're the same in many ways, but different. So, of course, birds also use melanins in just the same way. And they have eumelanin and pheomelanin. The melanosomes are just the same. The, the chemical composition is just the same. And indeed, they can use the um, arrangement of those melanosomes to give iridescent effects. So that certain hummingbirds and, and kingfishers and others can generate colors that are, that are um, nanostructural color, colors. They're physical colors produced by reflection uh, strategies within the, the structure of the feather. And so birds do a lot more of that than mammals. On the whole, mammals, somebody did tell me there's a particular horse that has some sort of iridescent kind of effect within the hair, but it's quite rare. Um, and mostly birds do much more of that than mammals do. And so, of course, a famous question is, what color is a kingfisher at night? It's a dull brown. It's only got that beautiful blue, of course, when it flashes in, in light. It's, it's an optical illusion. And then added to that, of course, birds do more than mammals do. Birds have sequestered dietary components, uh, such as carotenes and porphyrins, which can give them other colors. We know the stories of... Uh, uh, flamingos, if you don't feed them the right kinds of little shrimps where they get the carotenes, they kind of go white. So birds do an awful lot more than mammals do. But of course, there's a cr considerable homology. There's a considerable amount of shared um, structure and shared uh, uh, usage of, of pigment and so on between birds and mammals, in, in between hairs and feathers. So when you look at the... Um, when you look under the scanning electron microscope close up at a ginger patch and a brown or a black patch in a bird or a mammal, the ginger patch, the pheomelanin, is contained within pheomelanosomes, which are spherical, and they're about half a micron in size. Whereas in the darker areas, the commoner um, form of melanin, the eumelanin, is contained within eumelanosomes, which are more sausage-shaped, and they're about one micron. So there is a, an exact relationship between the two chemical variants of melanin and between the melanosomes within the keratin of the feather or hair that um, are predictable. And we, we use the extant phylogenetic bracket here because the fact that both mammals and birds have the same relationship between the chemical and the structure, which relates to the color, means that all those extinct groups, including dinosaurs, would almost certainly have had the same relationship. We can't prove it, but the likelihood is that they would have done, um, because that is such a standard in all living forms. So do you find melanosomes in fossils? Well, yes, you do. But this is something that's only been accepted for a relatively short amount of time. So Jakob Winter, who was then a PhD student at Yale, published a paper in 08 where he looked at this fossil feather and this is what it looks like. That's just a normal light photograph of a feather, a fossil feather. And you can see that it's got dark and pale stripes. And I think you can see that the striping is probably biological rather than some sort of geological artifact. It's something to do with the way that the, the color seems to follow within the barbs of the feather, that there's a sort of scalloped pattern here which is typical for any ornithologist, you'll know that this is a fairly typical appearance of the way stripes may appear, the, the, this kind of scalloping shape. And it would be rather difficult to think of some physical process um, that would damage the feather in some way, that, that, that would scrape off the, the, the feather structure in this way. And so when Winter looked in the dark areas under the SEM, he found it was packed with sausage-like structures. When he looked in the white areas, he was looking just at rock. And again, in the dark area at the bottom, sausage shapes. So he said in that paper uh, that these are eumelanosomes corresponding to a black or dark brown color. The rock is because, of course, there's no melanin. And so originally that would have been white because, of course, the natural un unmelanized color of a hair or a feather, of 
of the keratin is simply transparent. We would call it white, but they're transparent. It's only when you introduce, and that's like the white hair of an old person. When you introduce melanin, then you give it color. If you introduce porphyrins and, and carotenes, you give it color. Um, and, and of course, the interesting point about this is that the, you're looking at an optical illusion here because actually there's nothing there in the white area. You can only see the black parts of the feather. Um, <clears throat> and they are preserved by virtue of the presence of melanin because melanin is a very tough biomolecule. It's very resilient. Um, and we know that it's tough in, 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 in uh, uh, organisms today. When you're young and your hair is colored with melanin, it's tougher than when you're old. And so an old person's hair, when it goes white, is weak. It's weaker than when it had melanin. And coloring it with black or ginger dye doesn't strengthen it. I think you know that. Um, a lot of seabirds have white feathers, so that means they have no melanin. But often the tip of the wing has just a tab of black. And that's, that's for strengthening purposes, so that if they run into a cliff or a tree or something, that sort of preserves the feather because it strengthens. They found evidence, they argued, in a second paper of iridescent effect because of the uh, uh, parallel packing of melanosomes in fossil feathers. Um, and then when we looked at the feathers of Confucius Ornus, we found both eumelanosomes and pheomelanosomes. So I'd like you, well, let's pop back to the modern birds. So look at those. That's what they look like in the modern uh, uh, example. And if, that, if these were human hairs from a black-haired and a ginger-haired person, they would look just the same. And here they are in the fossil. So they're a little bit distorted, particularly in the case of the pheomelanosomes. You can see some of them have shrunk. So there's a sort of um, moldic impression within the keratin structure behind. And then the, 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 the melanosome itself has kind of shrunk a bit. It's still more or less spherical. So even though they shrink, that's all that seems to happen over millions of years. They're still there. And so we argue these are not bacteria following Vinter. These are within the structure of the feather. And I think the evidence for that is in particularly this kind of example, where you can actually see the moldic impression and the melanosome itself kind of floating within it. So there are doubters who we, we published another, you know, we published these papers, and there's always a, a flurry of people who come and criticize and say, oh, no, no, these are just bacteria. So we stick with that argument that if they were bacteria, they would be forming a kind of goo or, or gummy slime over the decaying carcass um, and it would be kind of evenly distributed across the whole carcass not as in the case of that feather strictly restricted only to those black areas not a hint of any of these structures in the white area absolutely not a hint and if there was a sort of decay bacterial film it would kind of splodge over the whole thing we argue then when we looked at Sinoceropteryx, we were keen then to determine its color. Here we're getting down to business. We looked at feathers from various of the darker bands, and we also looked in the pale bands. In the pale bands, like Vinter, we found nothing. It's just rock. There's nothing left. So we hypothesized that there was no color there, that these would have looked white in life, or that perhaps feathers were entirely absent. It might have been some strange sort of tufted, like something like a Christmas tree. But we think it's more likely that there were uh, uh, pale to dark colors uh, with feathers all the way. And of course, when we looked in these, all we could find were pheomelanosomes. So whereas Confucius Ornus had both types, Sinoceropteryx, wherever you looked, only has the ginger type. And so that's why we argued for that reconstruction. So now we would say that's what it looked like. So this was the first true-to-life colored reconstruction of a dinosaur. What we don't know, of course, is whether they could also use carotenes and porphyrins because they're undetectable at the moment because they don't embed themselves within the feather in a capsule or, or any kind of physically detectable structure, as far as we know. And chemical means of determination are difficult. We, we and other groups are pursuing both organic and inorganic chemical means of detecting fossil traces of these pigments, these various pigments, because <clears throat> each of them has its own organic signature. And we have now got evidence, chemical evidence, organic chemical evidence of ancient melanin, because it survives. It's, it's, it's recalcitrant. It, it doesn't break down particularly. 
you lose a few peaks, but more or less you get the, the pattern of carbon si signature of melanin still in these ancient fossils. But unfortunately, carotenes and porphyrins do break down. And people have also looked at the inorganic chemistry because each of the pigments, of course, has uh, metallic ions. So eumelanin has got copper, for example. Uh, pheomelanin has got sulfur. And to some extent, they contribute to the color. And of course, it's the same in carotenes and porphyrins. They have metallic ions built into the organic structure. But there are difficulties because, of course, organic uh, molecules break down. Some of them break down very fast. Um, and so it's unusual that melanin is preserved and that you can still see some trace of it. The metallic ions are a bit dodgy because, of course, you, it's difficult, as far as I'm aware, I'm not a chemist, to be really sure that any copper or sulfur or anything else that you find in a fossil actually derive from the, the living tissues of that organism. It's equally likely that they could be scavenging metallic ions from the surrounding sediments, and, and it's rather difficult to be sure. Nonetheless, I've given you the story, and, and we have ultra-structural evidence, which we believe is irrefutable. So what does this mean in a wider sense? So I, I could finish at that point and say, aren't we clever? We've done it. We can look at any fossil now, and we're looking at others. I'll show you another in a moment. And we can find, if we can find the melanosomes, if there are feathers, the likelihood is that there's melanin, then there will be melanosomes, then we can determine color and patterns. Um, but it's more than that. It, it says something about the evolution of birds. And this, is, this then is a kind of wider biological purpose to, to this kind of work, where we, 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 I hope I can show you that we're kind of crossing the barrier between um, modern and ancient and constantly hopping back and forwards, quite shamelessly. So at least we know from the Chinese fossils. Um, so here is Archaeopteryx. These are more advanced birds right the way through to present day. Um, and these are dinosaurs. And of course, we now know, here's Sinosauropteryx, that feathers of modern bird type were already present in, in a number of dinosaurs before birds originated. So this shows us at least one unique character of birds today actually originated well before Archaeopteryx. And we still use Archaeopteryx, and there's a lot of evidence to support it, as a marker of the first bird. It was called the first bird from 1861 when it was first found. And all these Chinese fossils don't change that. It still sits there. People have looked at that very carefully. And it says something about the development of feathers. So uh, Rick Prum wrote about, he is an embryologist, and he wrote about the um, development of feathers in embryos, mainly chick embryos, of course. And a feather emerges from the skin from a follicle, first as a hollow bristle. And no adult bird retains that kind of very simple, small, hollow bristle. They very quickly, as the um, bird develops uh, in the egg, um, uh, branch. They, they begin to branch. And branching is, so the hollow, the hollow rachis or vein is a characteristic of feathers. And secondly, the branching of, of the side branches in various ways whether in a kind of um, down feather for, for insulation or in a kind of contour feather for covering parts of the back and, and obviously forming the flight uh, area of the wing. So what we had found then in Sinosauropteryx, we think, is a sort of mimic of that very early stage in embryonic development. This is what the Yale group did. They chose a much more uh, exotic-looking dinosaur, which has much more elaborate patterning than our dinosaur. Uh, so they, they do find ginger. They found pheomelanosomes in the crest and on the cheek area. But they found these wonderful patterns of black and white across the wings. So both of those reconstructions then, we would argue, based on fundamental observation, microscopic observation, where we make no difference between looking at modern tissues and ancient tissues, we believe we have an exact way of doing it. So those two were published. We published before them, so we can claim priority, I suppose. They had a much more interesting dinosaur. Uh, and just to make sure there was no more squabbling, we hired Vinter, and he now works with us in Bristol. So, <clears throat> End of story, no more squabbling. Um, so earlier this year, we published another um, remarkable dinosaur, this time from Siberia. And this is nothing to do with birds now. This is an Ornithischian dinosaur. So 
Any of you who have read your children's um, dinosaur books will be aware that um, dinosaurs form a single large group, like mammals or birds. They have a single point of origin, class Dinosauria. Um, and there are two main groups of dinosaurs, the Sauriscian dinosaurs, which include birds, theropods and birds, and the Ornithischian dinosaurs, which are the other branch. And so they were not expected to have feathers. And so this is why we managed to get the paper into science, of course, because this was to say, right, the other half of dinosaurs also have feathers, which means all dinosaurs have feathers, not just the group of theropods that are close to the origin of birds. So here's our dinosaur, Kulinda dromaeus, named after the locality in Siberia. And the fossils show us very clearly that it had short feathers all over the trunk and the upper parts of the limbs. It had remarkable scales, something like a rat along the, the tail, and also on the limbs, on, on the lower parts of the limbs, just like a chicken or something like that. So this would suggest very much, whereas our previous ones had suggested maybe these feathers are as much for signaling as for uh, uh, insulation. Whereas on the other hand, this one looks a bit like insulation because the, the feathers are quite short and they seem to cover the body region, but not the peripheral limb regions. All of that, you can follow the logic, I'm sure. This is what these feathers look like. And lots of people said, oh, these are not feathers. They don't look like feathers. Um, so the, the, the body of the, the trunk of the animal is, and look at the scale. These are not terribly small. These are like, well, one millimeter across. These are little scale-like features. And they have a number of strands of sort of predictable lengths somehow attached onto the scale and extending backwards. So they're arranged in a kind of reasonably regular pattern like the scales on a modern reptile, but they have this fringe of whiskers. And so we're very interested to look more deeply into what they may be. Now they're obviously nothing to do, or let's say they're very different from the feathers of theropods and birds. So it seems then that various um, tetrapods, various vertebrates have been able to produce epidermal appendages of some kind. So very many vertebrates don't have them at all, but then mammals produce hairs, they come out of a follicle, they're, they're controlled genomically in the same way as the production of feathers in birds, so there's a sort of fundamental homology there between them, even though we, we know they look physically different. So it seems that Ornithischians represent maybe a third manifestation. They're not the same as mammals, they're not the same as birds and theropods, they're something else but very likely we can call them feathers or bristles or hairs, whatever you like, in terms of um, structures, in terms of physical structures. They're the same as hairs. They're the same as feathers. So that different groups can sprout these structures uh, in different ways. They look different, but genomically they're the same, we would predict. This is where they come from in Siberia, and these are the sort of questions, and, and we have to remember these points that um, Anatomically uh, and developmentally, hairs and feathers share a great deal. They're keratin, they come out of follicles. And as we now know, genomically, they're controlled by the same uh, uh, genes. And, and so we're discovering all these remarkable aspects of evolution, of course, by comparing anatomy, development, and, and genomic regulation. We don't know about the genomes of dinosaurs, of course, but that's just to calm people down, because lots of our critics said, these are not feathers, you can't call them feathers. We say, call them what you like, they're the same thing. You can call them X's or Y's or whatever you like, it doesn't matter, but they're the same thing. And a few other Ornithischians had already been presented before with very weird and wonderful structures. This is utterly ridiculous, and clearly is nothing to do with insulation. I really don't think it's anything to do with flight. It can only to be to do with what we would generally call signaling, showing off in some sort of way. And, and very likely the same for Tian Yulong. It's got this strange bristly row along the back. So this is all we know for Ornithischians, and, and this is our one here, which has got the most extensive covering of feathers. And latest news, only discovered yesterday, we didn't know this. We looked hard before the science paper was published. We couldn't find melanosomes. Now we know. These feathers are absolutely stuffed with melanosomes, but of a kind that's somehow intermediate between the phao melanosomes and the eu melanosomes. But we believe that this new discovery, as of yesterday, not published, we're still thinking about it, trying to get to grips with it, 
the fact that these weird structures on Colinda Dromaeus, which you can call feathers or call them what you like, they're made of keratin, they contain melanosomes. We're adding to the list, the tick list, of, of shared characters between hairs and feathers and bristles and all of these other structures that may occur. Let's just broaden it out, and, and I'll finish off just with a, a, a five minutes on really why I think this is important. Because everything I've shown you up to now, you, you could regard as, as just a trick. You could just say, oh, well, that's a clever thing to do. That's, but it doesn't really matter. It, 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 only kids will care about that. You know, the, the dinosaur fanatics websites will be full of this. Well, they are full of this. What color are dinosaurs? It doesn't really matter. So I think the, the, the rationale behind our interest in this is a broader question, which for an evolutionary biologist is important. And it, it would be the kind of question I think uh, anybody would perhaps ask. Let me put it this way. When you look around the world today, um, there are many millions of species, and yet those millions of species that, 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 that we, we enumerate, we try to name them and understand their relationships, actually they belong to a relatively small number of what you could call successful groups. So that amongst the vertebrates, you, you, you could label birds, lizards, rodents, teleost fishes, those four or five groups of vertebrates account for 90% of all species. Turn that round. You just have to look at four points of origin, and you have explained 90% of vertebrate diversity. That's a, an interesting way to think about it, maybe, or at least I find it interesting. Um, an, another way of looking at the same phenomenon is that um, the nearest relatives of birds are crocodiles. Um, both birds and crocodiles originated at the same time. They're what we call sister groups. So they have a common ancestor that lived in the Triassic about 250 million years ago. And so at that point, they branched. Crocodiles on one hand, birds on the other, or at least the ancestors of those. And so those two groups, crocodiles and their ancestors, birds and their ancestors, have had identical histories. They have they originated at the same time. They've been through all the same climatic changes, the movements of continents, uh, mass extinction events, all the same vicissitudes. And yet today, there are 23 species of crocodiles and 10,000 species of birds. And it's always been the same as you go back in time. Birds and then their ancestors, which include all of the dinosaurs, birds and all of the dinosaurs, they have always been really, really species rich. And the crocodiles, they have been more diverse in the past than they are today, but not much. Why would that be? The only reason for the difference must be traceable to something innate within those two groups. Birds and their ancestors, the dinosaurs, must have something, have had something that permits them or engages them in radiating, diversifying much more. And so when you frame that kind of issue, then you, you can try to explore what might be those characters. And there's a whole range of them. And, and one that you may not be so familiar with is, is this one. I'll just step through a, a few of these very briefly. Locomotor modules. We don't have tails, so we're not used to thinking about what tails might do. In, in most vertebrates, whether it's a dog or a lizard or whatever, the tail is associated with the hind limbs. And so it's part of that locomotor module. Whether the animal is a biped or a quadruped, as it walks along, the tail and the hind limbs are operating as one unit, and the forelimbs are operating as another. In birds, the tail is part of the forelimb locomotor module. So that in landing, in balancing, in running around, as the wings are moving, the tail is moving. And the hind limbs are operating independently as a separate little set of locomotor structures. So that's one issue that was, was noted quite a long time ago, and that seemingly happened long before the origin of birds. A second thing that had to happen, of course, was elongation of the forelimb, because you can't be a bird without a long pair of arms with all the feathers and all that stuff. Um, and yet, the, in the evolution of dinosaurs, particularly the um, theropods, the norm was reduction of the forelimb. So T. rex is famous. T. rex is a very advanced, a very derived 
theropod. Um, it has these pathetic little arms with two fingers. So shortening of the arm, reduction of the digits, that's absolutely the norm in theropods. Except in this wider group, the Manoraptorans, um, which include a variety of dinosaurs and birds. They elongated the arms and the, the, the wings. And they also evolved a particular carpal bone called the semilunate carpal that allows them to do something that mammals can't do, which is to fold that huge hand back. And it can fold perfectly back against the, the forearm. Uh, and, and so they can all do that because they have this particular carpal element that allows them to fold it back, and you know, the way a bird can tuck its wing up. There's a whole lot of stuff going on in the head. Um, and most of it can be explained by pedomorphosis. So this is the skull of an embryonic crocodile. There's the adult. Um, and so this, this is the skull of an embryonic dinosaur as well, or, or ancestor of all of these groups. And so a lot of what happened in birds, the, the enlargement of the eye socket of the orbit uh, and the eye itself, the uh, enlargement of the back of the skull and relative enlargement of the brain and of the sensory portions of the brain, shortening of the snout and, and the development of a sort of beak, reduction of teeth, all these things actually are pedomorphic, which you know uh, when you think about it. It sort of makes sense. So that the adult bird is like the juvenile ancestral form. Miniaturization, of course. If you're going to fly, it's helpful to be small. That was not the way it happened, of course, because evolution doesn't have foresight. But nonetheless, these things were all happening before, long before Archaeopteryx. And so miniaturization was a real uh, phenomenon, not just for birds. Here's Archaeopteryx over here. So these are the birds. Jurassic Cretaceous, this is about 150 million years ago. There's Archaeopteryx. But these are all dinosaurs. And yet you can see these are all relatively, these are all drawn to relative size against each other. There's a whole swathe of small forms all over here. And so miniaturization happened at the root of paraves. Um, and then various other groups subsequently got larger. There's a normal tendency in evolution, which is sometimes called Cope's rule. Normally, organisms tend to get bigger. Um, and that was true of dinosaurs in general, except for this group, paraves, that led to birds. <clears throat> and so there it is. Thanks to all these Chinese fossils, we know about this amazing array of dinosaurs that could fly. They were all small, they all had elongated forelimbs, they all obviously had feathers, and they had all these other characteristics, pedomorphic heads and all these other things, all happening before Archaeopteryx. So we're, we're kind of building up a, a, a succession of major changes in evolution. A lot of what I'm telling you is quite recent because it's based upon these new specimens and new methods. So what does it all mean? We, we can now... So a lot of what I've done is descriptive, but we can now apply a testing regime to try to um, understand which characteristics might be important. And there are numerical methods of exploring these kinds of phenomena, which I will only touch on briefly. Here's a study that my PhD student, Mark Puttick, did. Um, we took an evolutionary tree of um, birds uh, and related dinosaurs. And we were trying to look at body size evolution and evolution of the forelimb coupled across that tree. And what we found was here are birds in green, and here are the dinosaur relatives, and this is collectively called the paraves. And we found here the length of the line. This is an evolutionary tree roughly against time. And something about the rate of evolution. So what Mark Puttick did was to, it, we had body sizes for each species at the tip of each of these lines. So this is 100 or more species, which I showed you just a second ago. This is just rendered slightly differently. Each of the tips is a species. Each of it has a body mass. Each of it has a wing length. So we explored those. The blues indicate slow evolution. Green something intermediate. Reds very fast. And what he found was that when body size and wing length were coupled together and explored, there was an explosion in rate of change at the root of paraves. So this was a very fast, almost certainly selective evolutionary shift, because you can use these numerical methods then to look for 
evolutionary change that is faster than normal or slower than normal. Um, and so, but what he found was body size was miniaturizing very fast. Wing length was extending. But when he looked at wing length alone, he found no particular change in the rate of evolution. So what he was arguing was that a medium-sized Paravian kept the wing length that it had, but its descendants got rapidly smaller. Therefore, the wing length was relatively longer. But the selection was for miniaturization, not for elongation of the forelimb. So you have to imagine your Christmas turkey, big and fat with its wing, and then getting very small. But the wing stays the same. So that's what was going on, we think. I don't know what it all means. But then everybody else had the same idea. We publish first, as usual. Not so, not so good as the others. So um, Mike Lee from Australia did a much more extensive study, and he got it into science. And he found that this was not only a shift at this point of body size, but it was a long-term trajectory of reduction in body size. Here are the birds in red. These are all dinosaurs over here. Another study by Roger Benson at Oxford found the same thing. These are all independent, just published in the last few months. So I'll stop at that and just summarize. Um, I've tried to um, show you a little bit about how paleontologists can interpret data. If you thought it was all arm-waving and guesswork, I hope I've convinced you that it's, well, maybe partly that, but not completely. Um, we believe that in some cases, at least, the fossils are sufficiently well-preserved that we can use quite um, detailed, ultra-structural, anatomical approaches to um, interpret the fossils and, we believe, make exact comparisons with modern forms in a way that we believe is pretty objective. This, this is exemplified by this sort of party trick of being able to tell the color of a fossil feather. Um, but I hope in the last few minutes I've shown you that this could potentially be uh, part of a larger question about the fundamentals of evolution, the fundamentals of biodiversity. Why is life as we see it around us the way it is? Why are some groups successful and other groups not successful? Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing the Nottingham Medkai bang up to date with uh, the dinosaurs. Um, that was an absolutely brilliant and thought-provoking lecture. Um, Mike has very kindly agreed to answer some questions, so if anyone has any questions? Um, I shall be passing the microphone around so that uh, everyone can hear. Roger. Yes, thank you very much for that. It's very interesting. Um, about the, the methods that you use to analyze the melanins and various things like that, and accepting that this is a long time ago and quite a lot of it's disappeared. But uh, a colleague of mine has uh, very recently published a paper about bones from sailors in the Mary Rose, oh, yes. which is about 430 years ago, uh, which were quite well preserved. And he used a technique of uh, Raman spectroscopy so I wonder whether you use that sort of technique in your work or something similar. So was he using that to determine the proteins and... Yes, both yes. proteins, yes. amino yes. acids, yes. And, and, yes. and minerals as well. Yes. It seems quite a useful technique. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we've begun to try that. So um, we, we looked at some specimens, and we have colleagues in Bristol who do this kind of chemical approach. Um, and they claim they've been able to rec recognize collagen in some of our fossil birds. So there are two or three different um, mass spectroscopic and other um, geochemical techniques that you can use to look for organic molecules in different ways. People traditionally use pyrolysis, which you, you sort of burnt it off and you get the, the, the carbon signatures. That doesn't always work with fossils. Um, we've used Raman spectroscopy that you mentioned. We've also used something called time of flight off sims, time of flight, something or other mass spectroscopy. I don't remember exactly what it is. And that's analogous to, in some ways, to pyrolysis, but it doesn't destroy the specimen and it can work on smaller samples. So yes, we are trying out every, every, every uh, technique that exists. I suppose we can't have an expert in front of us and not ask them the question, why did they disappear? 
Well, they didn't, of course. Birds are still around. So, um, but yes, the big dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs. So it's very clear to most paleontologists, I think, that birds are living dinosaurs. And I hope in what I've shown you, it's not a, it's not a kind of um, throwaway remark. It is fundamentally the case and particularly in view of that comparison of the crocodile line and the bird line. Dinosaurs are fundamentally part of that bird line. So whatever it is that makes birds today successful, some aspects, not all, but some aspects may well have been present in the dinosaurs. And we've looked at all the feathers and lots of other things. Um, yes, but the big dinosaurs died out, you're right. Um, I don't know if I can actually answer that. You know, it, there's been so much effort put into it. We know that a meteorite hit the Earth 66 million years ago. It hit in Mexico. The crater is there. We know where it was. We know the consequences that um, on hitting, well, many large meteorites hit the Earth but don't cause extinction. That one, it's believed, did because it hit in shallow sea. It hit an area of limestone and um, evaporites, meaning salts. And so those uh, sediments on the seafloor uh, at the end of the Cretaceous were vaporized. And we know that because there are melt, there are melt products from that impact. And normally a melt product from a volcanic eruption will have the chemistry of, an, of a lava. It'll have an igneous chemistry. So these melt products, they're, they're, they have the chemistry of sedimentary rocks. They're limestones and calcium carbonate and sulfur and other components of salt. Um, and so it's believed that that may have had an effect of, of turning to gas those chemicals and blasting the atmosphere and poisoning life or something. But in addition, the, 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 the amount of dust that was lofted high in the atmosphere, it fell all over the world. So we know it, it circulated around the whole world, one impact, but the ash, the very fine ash, went all around the world and settled, and you can find it at that level in America, New Zealand, Australia, Russia, it's everywhere. Um, and perhaps that blacked out the sun, and there is evidence for freezing and, and so on. But then why did anything survive? That's, that's actually the question. Everything should have been killed in those conditions of nuclear winter persisting for a year or two. Probably the, the dinosaurs that died, they were big. They may have been specialized. They were the sort of elephants of their day, small population sizes, those kinds of things makes you vulnerable to extinction. Well, as Jeff has come up, can I ask you, uh, some dinosaurs were very big, some were very small. You showed mounts of uh, Archaeopteryx and of the uh, birds uh, and of the dinosaurs you uh, studied. So how small were these dinosaurs that you read? How famous? Yes, yeah, so the question is about the, the size of these dinosaurs. So you're quite right, yes. Um, on average, if you look at the size distribution of all dinosaurs, they are an order of magnitude larger than mammals. So they're 10 times larger, all the way from the smallest to the largest. So the smallest dinosaurs would be about half a meter in length and height. So like a big chicken, that sort of thing. And so most of those feathered flying forms, they were less than a meter. Um, and so they're all within that range. But I don't think there are any really small ones. So Archaeopteryx, if I'm just trying to visualize, I, I saw the one in Berlin quite recently. It's sort of jackdaw sized. So again, maybe half a meter at most from the tip of the beak to the tip of the tail. So none of them are tiny. You know, they're not, they're not originating as sparrow sized creatures. Um, but they're definitely within the range, right in the middle of the range of normal flying birds today. Um, after all these tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, you seem to have a, a, a ginger dinosaur. Now, I have a ginger grandson. Oh, yes. Who, and there are similarities. I see. Is there anything advantageous to the ginger um, Anything advantageous? I, I really don't know. You can at least, knowing that the color comes from pheomelanin, you can at least say, I'm a rarity or I'm special. But I don't know if, I don't believe anybody has, no, I wouldn't wish to speculate, and I don't believe anybody has pinned down any, well, I suppose you could talk about medieval choleric and, and humors and things like that, but no, I know nothing about that. Okay. I think uh, we'll draw. 
Oh, one, one more question. Oh. Yes, it is. Uh, so, is we would, I think the majority of people would still say it's a, it's a bird. Um, but of course, if you, if you were to define birds strictly according to living birds, and at one end you might have the sparrow, and at the other end you might have the ostrich, the obviously flightless bird, and you could then track back to their ancestor, that would be something in the late Cretaceous, maybe 70 million years ago. So Archaeopteryx is much older. And so then it is a sort of semantic question because you've got the living birds and therefore we know their common ancestor is a bird according to modern forms. But all these fossil ones of, in China, they are all down the evolutionary tree and Archaeopteryx is here. But I think most people are still happy to call it a, a bird um, because although lots of the characters that used to distinguish birds from crocodiles because of these dinosaur fossils, we know that they originated much earlier, including feathers. Archaeopteryx still has the unique fact that it could uh, engage in powered flight. None of those other flying dinosaurs had the right wing size, because there's a definite relationship between the wing area and the body mass. And you have to have the, a big enough wing area to get lift and to fly. And so all of those extraordinary feathered dinosaurs either were not flying at all, like this one here. It's got nothing like a wing. It's obviously not a flyer. But those that did have wings, they, they could only glide. Um, and so Archaeopteryx then still does represent that leap in the dark, if you like, into proper flapping flight. So that's why I would still call it a bird, because we would say perhaps flapping flight is the critical reason for the success of birds. Kind of logical. One last question. Rami. This might be a silly question. Uh, we think that humans originated, say, in Ethiopia or in East Africa. <coughs> Where would you say dinosaurs <coughs> originated? Would it be more in China or again? In no. So dinosaurs, you've always got to be careful, of course, because just because one fossil is older than another, we don't have a complete fossil record, so you've got to be careful. But the oldest dinosaurs, and, and this has been repeatedly the case, come from Argentina. So it seems that perhaps dinosaurs did originate perhaps in South America. Um, but that could be overturned next week. You know, if somebody finds one that is five million years older in China or in uh, Nottinghamshire, then. So we'd always wish to be careful about a simple joining the dots type of approach. Um, yeah. But, but there's, there's five or six dinosaurs no, now known from South America which are considerably older than any other dinosaur. So they'd already begun to diversify, it seems. OK, I'm now going to ask my fear melanin pathological friend and colleague, Dr. <laughs> Tom McCulloch, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Jeff. I was going to say that as well. <laughs> well uh, thank you. I didn't know what to say when Jeff asked me to do, do the vote of thanks. What I definitely thought I wouldn't say is that Professor Benton and I both work with dinosaurs. So obviously, that would be uh, <laughs> uh, wrong, uh, or would it? Um, what I, w I was just musing on how, um, when you mentioned the, the, the seven-year-old boy, because I think there are probably some people around here, and certainly I was that seven-year-old boy 40-odd years ago, who was completely bonkers about dinosaurs. Uh, and um, back in the day, of course, you know, they, it's just amazing to think how um, the, our, our, our perception of them has changed from big green scaly things to this rather more sophisticated um, view with feathers. Um, although I would say um, there's part of me thinks that actually um, thinking of a uh, velociraptor running around with feathers is somehow wrong. You know, it just doesn't seem scary. Maybe I'm a dinosaur, I don't know. Uh, but what I would say is uh, that's a really fantastic and, uh, and uh, a very interesting lecture, uh, very detailed and very and completely up to date, which of course, as medics, that's what we like to see, something bang up to date, uh, right as of yesterday. So I'd, uh, if uh, possible, I'd uh, like to propose a vote of thanks to Professor Benton. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next lecture is 
in uh, January uh, when Professor Joe Haig is going to talk to us about global warming, which will be another fascinating lecture, I'm absolutely certain. Uh, so all that remains for me to say is to wish you a Merry Christmas, and Happy Hanukkah, and uh, Happy Successful and Peaceful New Year. Thank you.